Great. Uh, well, thank you, Steve, for the uh, 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 offer to come on here today. And uh, also thanks to Library 2.0. Uh, my name is Jeff Jokish, and I'm here to talk about uh, text-to-image AI, a uh, hands-on primer on the uh, tech and implications. Hopefully, we can have a little bit of fun. There's a lot of information to cover and not a whole lot of time. I've actually got a whole bunch of slides, and so we're probably going to go through some of them pretty quickly. Um, uh, I have started the recording, so we're good to go there. If anybody has any questions, um, please type them into the chat, and I'll try to take care of those. Let me see if I've got the uh, chat window open here. Um, I think I do. But I do not. Oops. Uh, we can go through those. Uh, thanks also to the School of Information. We've got the recording going. Um, all right. I'm opening up the chat window there, so I've got it. Okay, now we're good to go. So I said, as I said, I'm Jeff Jokish. I'm the CEO of Privacy Plan. I'm a data privacy researcher. I'm also a sort of a data governance guy. I do a lot of work as data steward at the Data Collaboration Alliance, and I'm the host of a weekly privacy show called Your Bites, Your Rights. Uh, I've worked with a lot of libraries in the past through some other companies. Um, I won't really go into that because we don't have a lot of time. So let's uh, go a little bit further. The agenda today is to sort of talk about how does this AI stuff work? Uh, we'll do a little hands-on and then talk about the implications. So how does text to image work? Uh, we're gonna go a little bit into the details uh, only because it's important to understand how it works to really be able to interpret it. So this is an image here. How do we sort of interpret this image in a mechanical way? Um, Back in about 2015, it became apparent that mm, uh, AI could really start to tag these images. So people could tag it, but, but uh, AI began to tag it as well. So it could say, this is a sky, it's a sunset, there are trees, there's a man standing, there's a woman sitting, there's a paddle, an oar, a paddle board, it's on a river, there's some water, right? Um, but they also found that they could actually uh, uh, put a narrative together that this was a couple paddle boring on a river at sunset. Right. Um, and this was interesting because after they began to do that, researchers said, well, what if we could do the inverse of that? Could we say couple paddleboarding on a river at sunset and have it generate an image of that rather than actually, you know, just tag it as that? And it was a very provocative question. And in about a year after they asked this question, they, they presented this paper um, called Generating Images from Captions with Attention. Uh, in 2016 from University of Toronto. And it was pretty groundbreaking. So this is from this paper, right? Stop signs uh, flying and blue skies. These are only like 256 by 256 images, but you can actually sort of see the stop sign in the sky. And the same thing here with green school buses parked in a, in a, in a parking lot. Um, it is pretty amazing. Um, the AI knows that it's a school bus, and they, they understand the concept of school bus, they understand the concept of green, and they can overlay the two ideas, and that is pretty amazing. So from that point in time, things just really sort of took off. Uh, we're not going to really talk about all of this stuff, right? But it's sort of important to understand that all this research just really took off from this point. There was a paper in 2007, 2018, um, and, and then like in 2021, a bunch of papers. And 2022 is not even over yet. There's already five major papers out on, on all this technology and going in lots of different directions. I've actually got links in, in the presentation that you guys can get if you're interested in trying to understand the math, which is pretty complicated. Um, these are actually the met um, some of these papers sort of present, and there's sort of four different ones here. Um, what's sort of important, though, to understand just is the fact that there are different models. The top one here is called a GAN, or a, gener a Generative Adversarial Network. Uh, that's the one that DALI uses. Um, and it's sort of interesting, but it has some limitations. The bottom one is called the diffusion model, and that's the one we're going to talk more about today, um, and that's the basis for stable diffusion. These, all of these models, though, employ 
what's called deep learning. And um, we know that AI processes learn by studying vast amounts of, sorry, I'm trying to move the screen around here, vast amounts of, of information by tagging images, millions of images, cats, motorcycles, bananas, balloons, but also color styles and, and moves. But how does it learn these things and, and then understand them? Jess Fong um, at uh, Vox had a really great summary of this, and I want to share that with you. Um, sorry, I forgot to flip there. So I'm going to play this quick little video because I think it's really important to understand it, and this captures it better than I could. That's what deep learning does. In order to understand that this arrangement of pixels is a banana and this arrangement of pixels is a balloon, it looks for metrics that help separate these images in mathematical space. So how about color? If we measure the amount of yellow in the image, that would put the banana over here and the balloon over here in this one-dimensional space. But then what if we run into this? Now our yellowness metric isn't very good at separating bananas from balloons. We need a different variable. So let's add an axis for roundness. Now we've got a two-dimensional space with the round balloons up here and the banana down here. But if we look at more data, we may come across a banana that's pretty round and a balloon that isn't. So maybe there's some way to measure shininess. Balloons usually have a shiny spot. Now we have a three-dimensional space. And ideally, when we get a new image, we can measure those three variables and see whether it falls in the banana region or the balloon region of the space. But what if we want our model to recognize not just bananas and balloons, but all these other things? Yellowness, roundness, and shininess don't capture what's distinct about these objects. We need better variables, and we need a lot more of them. That's what deep learning algorithms do as they go through all the training data. They find variables that help improve their performance on the task. And in the process, they build out a mathematical space with way more than three dimensions. We are incapable of picturing multidimensional space, but Midjourney's model offered this and I like it. So we'll say this represents the latent space of the model and it has more than 500 dimensions. Those 500 axes represent variables that humans wouldn't even recognize or have names for, but the result is that the space has meaningful clusters, a region that captures the essence of banananess, a region that represents the textures and colors of photos from the 1960s, an area for snow and an area for globes and snow globes somewhere in between. Any point in this space can be thought of as the recipe for a possible image, and the text prompt is what navigates us to that location. So it's pretty cool. I think as, as librarians, you probably can, can understand sort of the value of that kind of a, a, a taxonomy. Um, it really sort of is the kind of stuff that I do, and I think it sort of overlaps with the kind of stuff that librarians do. So how do we actually apply that, though? Um, That's oh, what deep learning sorry. Got. Trying to move to the next slide. So if we actually look at this, um, these models sort of work this way, right? A corgi playing a flame throwing trumpet, right? It starts with an image of a corgi, maybe a corgi and a trumpet, and it encodes them. It puts them in this latent space and then sort of decodes them. But you'll notice that um, the corgi changes, the trumpet changes, maybe it, it adds the flames in here, but it also changes all the other stuff. And the important thing here, right, is that the corgi that comes out on the other end, the trumpet that comes out on the other end is different than what went in. The corgi-ness, the trumpet-ness, the flame-ness, the flame-throwing-ness, the, the playing trumpet-ness of all of these things changes. So let's actually do a little bit of hands-on work so that you can get sort of a better feel for not just conceptually how these things work, but how they really work. So the first tool that we'll look at is DALI, which is the one that most people have heard of. It's a generative adversarial network, as I said. It's sort of faster, better, uh, more simple, clean, especially for non-photographic uh, uh, work. It's also open access, but it costs credits. Uh, there's some more information about it here, um, and uh, we're just going to go ahead and open it up here. I've actually got it open on this other screen. Can everybody see that? 
hopefully you can you should see some some uh some carrots that uh look like motorcycles and i actually did this prompt and ran this earlier a motorcycle if it was a carrot and this uh dolly works really well with sort of abstract ideas like this and i want to show you so these are actually other things that i've already ran when when you run dolly here it'll actually give you sort of like four results because when it's trying to sort of give you a result, it doesn't always get the right thing. Um, so giving you sort of four different guesses at what you might want is sort of like important. In fact, you might want to even run it again to try to get something different. You often have to change the prompt to actually get what you want out of the result. This is actually given a name. It's got a couple different names, but a lot of people call it now prompt engineering because it's becoming an art, maybe even a science, and it's probably going to end up being a job in the future. Um, so if we want to move over here, uh, I'm going to go back over here to this slide and take a look here. Um, this is one that I did uh, a while back called Mike Tyson Painted by Vincent Van Gogh. And I think it actually came out really well, but it took me a while to get there. And if I come back over here and go to my collection, you can actually see a bunch of stuff. Here's some other Mike Tyson painted, uh, but I was actually trying to get to something particular. And I started out here, Mike Tyson uh, face tattoo painted by Van Gogh. You notice I actually spelled Van Gogh wrong, right? And so it, it didn't apply that correctly. But you also notice, right, Mike Tyson with face tattoo, right? It didn't put Mike Tyson and the face tattoo that Mike Tyson actually has on his face, it just applied a face tattoo uh, that somebody painted on Mike Tyson. So it didn't actually understand what I wanted, uh, which is a bit of a problem here, right? And it did that in a couple different variations. So I tried it again here, right? Mike Tyson with face tattoo in the style of, because I didn't realize I had actually misspelled Van Gogh, right? So I tried it again and it gave me different results. Still didn't get anything right. Um, so then I realized that I'd actually spelled Van Gogh wrong and I tried it again, right? So then it actually started giving me the Van Gogh style, but still didn't understand that I wanted the Mike Tyson with his face tattoo. So I never actually was able to get the model to understand that I'd wanted the Mike Tyson picture with the face tattoo. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, but, uh, you can sort of see the problem. So, and I started going a different direction. I was like, well, how about Mike Tyson with face tattoo in the style of Starry Starry Night? So got some interesting images, but still, you know, it still never understood that, right? And I finally just got rid of the whole face tattoo thing and got some awesome results, but you know, the face tattoo thing is gone. So you can see that it can come up with some really sort of brilliant images, but not really necessarily exactly what you want at times, right? If I come back over here uh, and look at, uh, sorry, well, I'm going to actually go on, right? So here's another example, girl with mohawk and, you know, on a motorcycle in a cornfield, right? Really well, right? Great motorcycle, great body of the girl. She's got a mohawk. She's in a cornfield. This looks pretty awesome. The face here is distorted a lot, right? And Dali doesn't do great with faces when it sort of recreates them. Um, so that's a bit of a problem, but otherwise this is pretty damn great uh, in terms of image generation. Um, if anybody actually has a, a prompt that they'd like to try inside of Dali uh, and wants to type that into the chat, we can actually run that here. We'll, we'll test that out. But otherwise, I'm going to keep going because we've, we've got sort of limited time here, right? Um, here's another one from Dali that sort of gives you an idea of some of its uh, coolness and its limitation. I really like this one, a cyber world with palm tree and an expressive oil painting, right? So when I said a cyber world, the model didn't really understand uh, what I was going with with cyber world so put like a little phone here and I guess you could maybe see a little outline but if I had said like a cityscape right cyber cityscape it might have actually done something better uh, the other images that it threw up the other three had nothing in the background other than like a palm tree 
So it got the palm tree right and it got some really cool colors, but there was really no cyberness to it other than sort of the feel. There was no cyber, no cyber worldness to it, right? So I'm going to try here the, uh, let me actually reconnect this. Uh, sorry. While you do that, Jeff, there are a couple of suggestions in the chat if you want to run something live. Yep, I just saw that and I'm getting over to it. And I'm going to paste that in there. Black cat with a witch hat and a purple moon. We'll generate that and we'll keep going. We'll come back to that in just a second. Another one here that we did was the eye of providence. Like that's the eye on the top of the pyramid on the, the back of the dollar over a colorful data stream as an expressive oil painting. Pretty cool, right? So that's not bad at all. Um, the other model that I wanted to show you here was stable diffusion. Now, stable diffusion is a is the latent diffusion model that we sort of talked a little bit more about. Better at photorealistic, better at faces. It also has a feature called in painting, which is really cool. Um, it's free. It's open source. It has lots of implementation. Um, it's a little bit hard to use uh, because it's free and open source, but there's lots of cool feature functionalities. Let's go back over here and take a look at that uh, witch black hat. So here we've got some pretty cool things, right? Um, what was the cat? A black cat with a with a witch hat and a purple moon. So notice here, right? It has a purple hat, not a purple moon. Uh, it actually only one of them had actually got the purple moon right. Sometimes it doesn't understand wh where the color should be applied, right? So it has some problems with where it should apply which variables. It got purple into all of them, but not necessarily the purple moon, right? So you have to sort of understand some of the limitations here. That's why these prompt engineering things, understanding how it's going to apply different variables is really important. And you'll understand that maybe a lot more when you see how complicated this is. So this is a collaboration through Google Colab Research that applies all the stable diffusion variables, right? And this is something that like some guy put together. A lot of people use it though. It's not, so it's not just some guy, it's some guy that really knows what he's doing, but it allows me to run different prompts in stable diffusion. And I can change all these different variables and then press it and have it run stuff. And so the last thing that I actually was trying to run was uh, what a motorcycle if it was a carrot. Um, and it looks like it's actually trying to run something there. I actually ran it earlier, but I hadn't connected it to my Google Drive. So it may be in a loop. That could be a problem here. But I can show you what it's done before. So this is one, right? This is like a stunning image, right? A young woman wearing a hat. Greg Rutkowski, art germ, trending on art station, cinematic animation still by Lois Vanderbottle, Ilya Kushinov, metahuman. That's the prompt. All of those variables, and this is what popped out. It actually popped out several, but this is one of them. It was really cool. Now, the photorealism of the face is, is just amazing. And it does have this weird sort of artifact here that seems to be like a shadow of her hair, right? But I mean, this is amazing. Another interesting thing to note here is that it has this Greg Gretkowski in here. Greg is an artist who is unhappy that his artwork is being used in this model. So we're gonna talk about that in just a minute, right? Um, and the, one of the reasons his artwork is so used in this is because his, his name is a default prompt in stuff like this. So if you look down here, right, it's actually the default prompt on here. And so that's one of the reasons his stuff and other folks are being used so often. Um, and it's not always, it's not just him, right, but, but other folks as well. And so he's got a pretty good claim for being unhappy with the fact that his, at least his name is being used. So the question though is, is his art being used inappropriately? Um, that's a, a little bit different line. I would argue that his art isn't necessarily being used inappropriately, but 
I do think that if he doesn't want his name and art to be in there, he should be able to pull it out of the model, right? So let's talk a little bit more about that. Um, here's another stable diffusion thing, but I think you sort of see the point. Um, here's a final stable diffusion one. This one's lesbian dance theory as a rock record album cover, metahuman, right? But you can see, you can put so many different, you can also, you know, you can apply so many different like styles and emotions and different things to things that just completely reshape the images. It, it's pretty amazing, right? We didn't talk about mid journey, but it's another amazing tool, right? There's also several other minor ones that you can check out. Um, there's another technique. We're just talking about straight image generation, but there's a technique called image to image. So you start with an image, right? This first frog is something that this artist drew. He drew this base frog by hand, and then he put it in there and said, give me something better, right? And it drew this 3D frog. And then he actually improved it further. And so he used it as like a uh, scaffold to create his art. And so in a matter of 35 minutes, he went from concept to perfection. And so this is amazing tool for this particular artist. He's, he's using it to leverage his skills and he's incredibly happy with it, right? Here's another one, some guy took this this drawing that he did in like three seconds, right? And turned it into this. Is that amazing or what, right? How about this, right? This mother took her child's drawing, turned it into this. Can you imagine doing that for your kids? I think it's incredible, right? So there's all these good things that can come out of this, right? But what are really the implications? We can talk about the rewards, right? There's obviously innovation, right? There's productivity gains, right? There's new jobs. We sort of talked about prompt engineering, but what are the risks? Obviously, you know, Mr. Rykowski is pretty unhappy with the fact that his images are in there. There's also problems with bias. There's privacy violations. There's the ability to create deep fakes. Um, there's lost jobs. I mean, if this is so great at creating graphics, how many graphic artists might lose their jobs, uh, especially on the lower end of the, right? Um, yeah, as somebody said in the chat, what about degradation of skills? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, if nobody has to draw <laughs> anymore, the, you know, do people forget how to draw? Do we, do we lose the ability to, to do basic drawing? So let's talk about the copyright thing for a second, right? is this stealing, right? I would argue that it's not because of the way the stable diffusion models work, right? It's not taking Mr. Rutkowski's or anybody else's work directly. It's taking maybe the style of the way they work, they look at things, right? And, and, and taking that style and applying it, but it's not taking any of their work pieces directly, but their work pieces are incorporated into the corpus. So if they're in the corpus, and he doesn't want it in the corpus, I think he should be able to take him out. Perhaps like a DMCA, like a takedown notice, which I know all you librarians are familiar with that concept, right? Um, should he be able to say, take my stuff out of the corpus and retrain your model without my data? I, I think that's valid. So that's where I would go with this. Bias is another problem, right? And bias exists in any corpus. Um, if the corpus that is used to train this with all these images, it works the same way with words, but with images too, right? If the corpus portrays CEO, when you type in CEO as an older white male, is, is that a problem? What if every time you type in the word pretty, uh, a skinny white female shows up? If the corpus lacks diversity, in my mind, that is a problem, right? Debbie Reynolds, who's a privacy um, diva, right? She's known as the data diva, actually, said this to me uh, a couple of days ago. I've seen a few of these AI rendered black people, the AI portrays as having a complexion of a terracotta flower plant, a flower pot. Well, that's potentially a problem. At least it is to her, and she's a black woman. So is that a problem? Do we have bias in these models? that are perpetuated just based upon the fact that our culture has systemic bias in it, 
And do we have to address that somehow? I think, I think we do, but how? And I don't have an answer to that, but I, I do think that there is bias here that probably is going to cause some issues. Um, how about privacy violations? What if you find your images, your images in here, right? An artist has found her private medical records in one of these training sets. Here's the, here's the actual link. Ars Technica posted this. She actually found doctor images that she signed off on through HIPAA to say that her doctor could use these images and a bunch of other people's in here as well. Go back over here. I think it's, uh, yeah, you can actually see some of these images. These are all in the Leon uh, data set that is used to train stable diffusion and a bunch of other models. Not good, right? So you can imagine that if some, one person found this stuff, there's probably a heck of a lot more. So we got to have ways to be able to pull this stuff out. Um, and probably DMCA or that kind of a model would work here as well. So here's one last thing here. You can put your face into these models. See this guy here in the middle? His face is all around him here. If you've clicked on this video, you likely know about the AI art space, but did you know that you can now generate images using your own likeness in a near infinite number of styles? Stick around and I'll show you how I took these 20 photos of myself and got an open source and free to use AI to create these. It's pretty amazing. I'm actually thinking about doing it myself. You don't actually have to put your images into the public data set. You can actually sort of like put them into like this collab that I was showing you here. Um, I can actually create like a separate little data set of my own images and then add them to this data set and be able to generate myself as, you know, a superhero or whatever the hell I want to do. Right. And that technology is only going to get better and better. But if you, you clicked on this video, oh, sorry. If you clicked on sorry, but if you think about it, right, that really ties into the ability to create deep fakes of people. Um, and we know that's a problem. So while it's also really cool, it's also really scary. Um, I don't know where it necessarily takes us, but we know that deep fakes can cause a lot of griefs, uh, a lot of grief. And while I think I want to go play with that technology, it also scares the heck out of me from, from a privacy perspective. Um, we know that the biometrics that, that we give to people uh, for authentication are problematic already, this makes it more problematic. And then finally, you know, we talked about lost jobs. Uh, there's really, you know, not enough time to go into all of this, but there's some interesting stuff here. There's a, a great article on ad age, I think it is, um, for how agencies are actually using this, um, this technology. There's also some tools here on prompt engineering you might want to check out if you're interested. But uh, it's, it's really a changing world. And, and there's other stuff here we haven't even talked about. You can use this technology to take an image and improve it, not just, um, not just edit it, right? So there's ways you can actually extend an image um, as well as edit it. So you could take an image of you know, yourself and add in a mohawk on, on yourself or do things like that. You, that really the sky's the limit. So there's we're sort of at the end of this. Uh, I wish I could say a lot more because there's so much more to say, but it's only going to get better. It's only going to get scarier. Um, and I'll just stop now. <laughs> if you've got questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And we can go on a little bit longer, I guess, because we're sort of at the end of the conference. So if anybody wants to stay around, I'll, I'm happy to stay around and answer questions. It's like we got a question here in one of the, uh, your uh, slides it mentioned the new FBI warning. Uh, yeah, that's actually just about deep fakes. Um, that's not specifically about this. It's actually about deep fakes, uh, stolen PI for people applying to remote work positions. But um, 
I mean, this kind of technology will, will help enable that stuff more and more. But that's people actually, you know, using different tech. It actually could be some of this kind of tech, but to essentially apply for jobs that, that uh, you know, then they use, you know, um, farms in China, India, wherever to actually do the work. So they pretend to be somebody probably with the US tax ID and then do the work remotely. So, um, and it could be your tax ID that they're using to, to, to do that and which is sort of scary, right? So um, I guess that's it, we'll sort of wrap it up. But uh, hopefully that uh, gives you guys some knowledge and uh, you want to check this out and uh, at least be aware that this is out there because I think it's going to change a lot of things. Um, we didn't talk about text to video, but it's already out. Facebook and Google are both uh, showing um, showboat uh, technology. It's not available to use yet unless you've got a special invite, but you can type in the same kind of prompts as you can for creating images and actually create live videos. Uh, Facebook just released theirs, and as soon as Facebook released theirs, Google released something that's a little bit better. So uh, that's pretty hilarious. You know, they always like to do the infighting. Okay. Well, I don't see any other questions here, so I think we'll wrap it up. And I hope you all have a great and wonderful day. Um, and if you're uh, not working tomorrow, have a great weekend. <laughs> Take care, everyone.